Good evening, and welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church, and we give a hearty welcome to those who are listening out in the Siouxland atmosphere and so on. And we know that as you hear the word preached and the song sung and the word also spoken, that your faith will be strengthened on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Our opening hymn, Guide me, O thou great Redeemer. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Sanctify us in your truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Old Testament reading from the fifth chapter of Amos 
selected verses. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. And the epistle from the third chapter of Hebrews. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. And the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is the Holy Gospel of the Lord. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Boys and girls, you may now come forward. Maddie has a message for you, and you can be right here. And while they come forward, we sing, Celebrate This Child.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We all know the verses of scriptures most likely to greet us on a coffee cup or you might see it on a bumper sticker or a wall poster. Sometimes these verses keep us going and lift up our spirits when we need that boost for the moment. For example, Jeremiah chapter 29 pops up very, very frequently. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for you and your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. And then from Romans chapter 8, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And then from Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We can dig deep into these verses to get the full meaning, but in a pinch, they can keep us afloat when we are just treading spiritual water. Verses like these provide inspiration to keep us going. We never see the verses of today's passages used in this way. No one ever buys a cup with verse 21 on it. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. You never see that on a coffee cup. Even with the promise of treasure of heaven in that verse, we don't find this passage inspiring. We want to hurry past it and get to the coffee cup verses. We don't want to read this story, and when we do read it, we want to find a way to wiggle out of it, because we don't want to give everything that we own away. That's it in a nutshell. Everything starts off well enough, though. A man has the opportunity. Many of us would love to have. He catches Jesus at just the right time and he decides to ask him the big question, something that's been on his mind maybe for many, many years. And we might wonder, what kind of a question? If Jesus was standing right here, what question would you ask Jesus if we had the chance? What does the Bible say about homosexuality. Do I really have to forgive a person who has obviously done me wrong? Those are just a couple of examples. But the man who comes to Jesus in tonight's passage asks a question of a different sort, and he obviously takes his faith very, very seriously. He looks towards eternity. He looks towards heaven. And of course, in many of the gospel stories, people want something from Jesus right away. For example, they want a healing. They want Jesus to settle a family dispute. Or they just want enough faith to keep on going. Or they want one of their loved ones to come back to life or to get healed. You know what I mean. But this man's question concerns eternal life. It's like asking the children a question, and the answer always is Jesus. Well, the second best answer for any question spiritually that we might have would be about eternal life. So we don't know if he finds his life on earth comfortable, but he asks about eternal life. We know he takes his actions seriously. He has scrupulously followed the teachings of the scripture, He knows about the resurrection. He knows something about eternal life. Every church in the country 
would welcome this man who has this type of a question. But he also makes a startling demand of him. Jesus does not want him to double his tithe. Jesus does not want him to practice more generosity. Jesus tells him to sell everything he owns and help the poor with the proceeds. So we need to look carefully to understand Jesus' words to this man, who may now wish he had just let Jesus pass by and just wave at him, hello, or something like that. Jesus' message on the surface sounds straightforward. Give everything to the poor assures us of eternal life, it sounds like. But if we step back, however, we know that this simple explanation just doesn't work. We don't buy our way into eternal life. We don't understand salvation as a business transaction. In other words, if you do this, then you'll get heaven. If you give you know, a million dollars to charity, you'll get heaven or something like that. God is, does not work that way. Perhaps the thought crosses our minds that Jesus sets us up. Jesus tells the man, and by extension to us. So when Jesus is talking to this man, he's talking to us also this evening. Jesus shows no compromise with the man. He has to sell everything. Imagine. How could we do that? Think about it yourself. How could you do that? Could you do that? Well, if you didn't hardly have anything, let's just say we lost everything in the flood in 2011, and people did, or the tornado that happened a couple years later, there were people who lost everything. My dad's cousin and his wife lost everything about 20 years ago in Mitchell, South Dakota, when the tornado went through and took their home, and not only theirs, but other people's homes. They hung on for dear life. They were in that mobile home, but everything was demolished, everything, worldly possessions, gone. So it really can happen. So is it easy to give the rest away or something like that? So realistically, we can't really sell everything we own does Jesus issue an impossible command so that we would understand the futility of us saving ourselves on something that we might do or on our own merits? We could save ourselves only by doing what we can't actually do. Think about that. Could Jesus have pushed us to see that we can't earn our salvation and so we totally rely on grace. Grace, a big word. We know that salvation, we know that salvation only comes to us by God's grace. And Jesus indeed has done what we cannot do ourselves. In one way of understanding our salvation, we compare it to a debt we could never pay. And Jesus pays the debt we can't pay. We should take care with this kind of understanding so that, again, we do not envision God as an extortionist. We find humility in seeing our salvation as a debt that Jesus pays for us. But we don't push that so far that God becomes something like a loan shark. No. Jesus. Jesus could have made this point without telling the man to sell everything and give it to the poor. But the man asks about inheriting eternal life. You know, the word inherit implies something, not maybe money. One of our members' daughter inherited a car from her aunt. It's a Nothing extravagant, but boy, oh boy, it gets her around. She's in her 20s, and it's the greatest thing that could ever happen when you don't have a car yet, 
And now you get this old 10-year-old car with 100,000 miles on, but she had that in her will, that if anything ever would happen to me, she gets it, the niece. And what a nice remembrance, and, and so on. So that can happen that way. The money blocks the man, we find out at the end, from fully loving God. He has to sell all his possessions in order to free himself to love God. The money weighs this man down. Would the money weigh you down? You think about that yourself. If Jesus would tell that to you, what would you say? How far could you go? Could you go 50%, give it all? 50%, 80%, 90%, and what have you? So Jesus knew this man's heart. He knew what was in his heart because Jesus knows everything. Many people love their money or hobbies or jobs or families and friends, sports. It's not just money. It's not just things. But wherever we invest our time, whatever that might be, sometimes we do that more than we love God. So is God number one in your life? Was God number one in this man's life? And he was not number one. Jesus knew that. And so we ask ourselves that question too. We sometimes think, however, that we can keep all of these things as long as we don't love them. Oh, wow. Okay. So I don't love that car. I don't love those sports. I don't love those TV shows and what have you. But the main thing that really matters is what's in our hearts, what's in the man's heart. Jesus really does care. Now, Jesus really does care also about the poor, and he cares about the downtrodden. He cares about whatever the situation is. We are in life, and so on. Jesus wants us to feed the hungry. He wants us to protect the vulnerable. If we can't see this passage as buying our way to eternal life, or as a message about grace, or as teaching not to love our money, well then, what does this mean to us, this specific passage? Perhaps the answer lies in a slight word change that Jesus makes. The man asks about inheriting eternal life. Can we assume he hopes that God will include him in the resurrection? He doesn't want God to leave him out. Jesus answers that by selling everything and giving it to the poor. The man will have treasure in heaven. Jesus doesn't use the same words as the man's question. Perhaps Jesus calls the man and us to take a risk for the sake of the kingdom of God. Perhaps we can think about it this way. Who celebrates a victory with more joy than the person who has invested the most? Well, imagine a basketball game. You notice Maddie left right after church. She said, Pastor Zerpel, is it okay if I leave after the children's message to go watch half of our kids do a football game tonight? If I remember correctly, is that, would that be going on on a Thursday night? Is that possible, a football game? I said, yeah, you'll be back here Sunday. It's okay. We'll all forgive her, and that's fine. We all understand. She's taking care of these little kids here, and she's taking care of our high school youth, and that's what we have hired her for, and that's what we want her to do. Now, think about this for a second. Who enjoys... Or who celebrates a victory with more joy than the person who has invested the most? Imagine a basketball game. Who enjoys the win more? The player who gives his or her all and attends all of the practices and the workouts, or the player who attends the practices and the workouts only occasionally? And we know who will get to play the most, the one who 
puts in the most effort. Most coaches will make sure that that's the way it is done. The one who spends hours every day practicing or the one who occasionally practices. The more we invest, the more joy we experience. So Jesus calls the man and tells us also to invest in the kingdom of God. The more we give, the more sacrifices we make, the more involved we become, the more joy we will experience when we enter the kingdom of God. The more treasures we build up, the more it will matter to us. Not that God will love me more than you if I have invested in more than you. We're not saying that God loves us all equally. But that the experience of joy will well up in the one who has made the biggest investment. And when we put it in sweat equity and give sacrificially in all of the ways that God has enabled us to do that, we reflect God's love in and for us. So maybe Jesus tells us that we also build treasure in heaven, investing time to work among those who suffer may break our hearts for now. We see and experience things that grieve us. We can't give everything away. We couldn't live like that. We can take risks. We can invest in God's ministry among the poor, the hurting, and those who still need the salvation of the Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the gift of divine peace and a pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, let us pray to the Lord. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For a seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and the dying, and for all those who care for them, for Gordon Foss, who is going to have a biopsy. This is the father of Robin Johnson. For Kathy Jorgensen, who has stage four cancer and sister of Connie Nelson. For Jack Creens, external ulcers and brother to Connie Nelson. Dominic Du Bois, fractured wrist. Trisha Welch, upcoming heart testing in Rochester. And Jen Lay, who is now in the middle of the COVID. For Owen Barons, who has great improvement of COVID, but still in Omaha Hospital. Let us pray to the Lord. For Deanna Braun, celebrating a milestone birthday. And for Key Simon, celebrating his birthday, let us pray to the Lord. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We continue with the offertory.
pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us to forsake all trust in earthly gain and to find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And together, I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins, where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen.
Just a couple of announcements. Once again, it's great to see everyone in worship this evening. And we have the blue attendance and involvement cards. If you did not get one, there's a whole pile of them here. We ask that you would fill that out. And um, also on the back, the end of October, lots of activities in this month of October that you can look over. And then um, I want to um, mention that Sunday afternoon, about 4 or 5 o'clock, more like 3 o'clock, excuse me, and all day Monday and getting back Tuesday afternoon, the called staff will be gone to Des Moines for that once a year pastor's conference. But we'll have our cell phones, they'll be on vibrate, but we'll check them off and on. So if there's anything that you need, please feel free to get a hold of us. And that information is in the bulletin. Also, the Bible studies continue, though, this week. One is Tuesday evening, so that's possible, and Wednesday, and, and so on. So I hope that you'll take those in. They just started a couple of weeks ago. Um, LWML, um, uh, how do I want to say it? LWML Zone Rally is at St. Paul's Lutheran on October 16th, which would be about 10 days from now, and that's Saturday. All women, and there are always a few men who speak, who attend that. And our speaker did some mission work in South America. So he'll be the speaker, and he's a former member of Redeemer. His parents are still members there. So that information all, of course, is in the bulletin. I will not be here next Thursday. Pastor Sensit will be preaching as well as Sunday. My little sister, my little sister, lost her husband from colon cancer a few years ago, and now she's getting married again. She's 39, and she was three years old when she was flower girl at our wedding, and I was godparent as well as three of my other siblings for her. So my mom had her in 1982, and my oldest sister was born in 1958, so quite a spread. So we're going to St. Paul's next Saturday, Minnesota, and see her off. Because when she's married, then that's the way it is. So we're happy about that. So um, have a good week as you serve the Lord in word and deed.